Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I am filling in for Mark, and I'm going to be filling in for all his talks in the next couple, couple of days. Um, so I'm going to walk you through exactly what my talks are like, and I've partitioned this talk into four talks, actually. So this is just a book disclosure. So what the talk today is going to be mainly on just technique with a little bit of philosophy to start with. And then I'm going to be talking about, uh, on Friday at 8.45, trying to dis determine when to use uh, autologous fat versus uh, alloplastic implants. And then I'm going to be talking about a new talk that I've never given about filler framing, which I'm really excited about. And it's going to really articulate more in detail some of the philosophical constructs that I'm going to talk about early on in this talk. And then I'm going to talk about how to uh, decide between fat versus filler. So this is a sort of four-part series I'm giving over the next two days. So as you, as, as you know, aging is a volumetric loss. I don't think I have to convince you of that. Over the last decade, there's a paradigm shift. And if you look, really, if you look at this aging over 20 years, it's not more bone. It is less, or less bone. It's less soft tissue envelope. And there is, therefore, a concomitant exposure of bone. So a huge part of this is trying to replenish that soft tissue envelope. You know, the, the concept, I always like talking in, in ways that a patient can understand. I always say if you are a grape and you become a raisin over time, you know, don't stretch it and make it into a pea, but reinflate it back in toward a, a grape. And you see a lot of times overinflation, and I'm going to talk more specifically about that in some of my other talks, but I think it's really important that you underfill, especially the anterior cheek area, where in a dynamic state there can be some problems. This is a, a model that, again, I will be talking more on Friday about um, how to communicate with patients, but I really believe it's, it's a good way to look at this is that if you think about youth, we're oftentimes overfilled and too full in youth, and we're not trying to achieve that because it doesn't look right. And this is just a model of communication. So really, fat loss is linear. You just lose fat from birth to death so long as you have a metabolic you know, equivalent in terms of your weight, you don't, if you don't start gaining weight. If you maintain your weight, you think of a one-year-old, a ten-year-old, etc., it's just a volumetric loss over time. And so I really want to focus on this concept by Malcolm Gladwell. You've heard Mark talk about it as well, which is blink. And that's how conceptually we make a person look either better or worse, and we just make that judgment at ten feet away. And a lot of times what you have to do is help a, a female patient, which is the majority of patients, Reimagine their face because oftentimes they're very focused on the fine perioral rightids, they're very close to the mirror, and it doesn't change their blink. You need to help them understand blink. And if there, a lot of women are focused around the mouth, and so they over articulate a, a lip and just doesn't look right. So the goal is to change blink. And what is the, one of the major components in blink? It's shape. So if you think about a youthful 20 year old face, the reason why some women after their 30s don't want this exuberant fullness is because that is too fat. It's not fat looking, it's just full. And, and a lot of women don't want to have that. There's a sculpted look at 30 some that really I like to say it's an oval is probably the more ideal way of imagining this. And then it starts to sink further in in the buckle zone. A lot of women like that sculpted look and they say, look, can you keep the cheekbone high? And I really believe that, yes, some suppression is good. I'm not trying to completely annihilate the sub uh, sub-zygomatic space, but I believe that too much of a step off in this area actually exacerbates the skeletal show and makes things not so fluid and smooth and soft and youthful. And that continues to become more lower uh, face dominant. And you want to sort of bring back that shape toward what I would like to say is an oval. So, you know, how do you create an oval? Again, this is going to be talked more about in, in the, the new talk on fillers, but it's really not appropriate during a fat talk. And I just want you to start understanding shape. And I want you to start seeing shape when you're designing a patient's face. So let's just take some examples. We're going to focus on the mid-facial zone. Um, believe it or not, this is the same lighting. I, I, it's very hard to control for lighting when there's just more light after a procedure. This is a, a rhinoplasty and fat transfer about a year out. And, and if you look at the volumes I've used here, I'm trying to take this very heavy set fuller face and bring it, bring the attention back to the upper area. So a lot of times you think when you see a heavier face, you're going to make it look worse by adding fat, but you really want to selectively place it in the right places to actually make it look thinner. And when you're dealing with a, a, an Asian face or a half Asian face, you want to be very careful in your total volume. So this is a, an, also a younger patient, early 40s. So I'm just using a small degree. And the, the, the 0.5 is just a transition point where you don't want to have too exuberant a cheek. And then it actually exacerbates some of the 
of the area below the, uh, below the malar region and makes, it, I think, the person look older. And you can see here, actually, this is starting to get a little bit more uh, hollowness in the sub-malar sub, uh, region, where I think if I don't fill that area, it's going to look too cheeky. And so this is just blending it down. And the goal is not to memorize these numbers. In fact, these numbers have changed for me. This, this, I had come up with these numbers a couple years ago, and at 1.2, and all the numbers uh, on the lateral cheek are actually becoming much higher, probably in the 2 to 3 range, just because I'm really focused on the outer face. And this is another example here where I'm filling a little bit more laterally because she's a little bit cheeky in the lower portion, and so I'm trying to balance and blend that out. And this is, you can see, a really narrow gaunt face. So I want to bring a lot more attention to the subzygomatic area. And if you say, well, what are those three numbers down there? I'm going to actually break down what those three dimensions are in that area. But I just, that's a lateral buckle, medial bu uh, middle buckle, and medial buckle space. And to me, a huge part of this is not just filling the, the cheek area, but also filling the area below it so it blends. And so what you want to do is have a face that doesn't have any tr major uh, shadow. So when you augment areas and create highlights, the last thing you want to do is create highlights and then exacerbate shadows in other parts of the face. And this is showing you again, what is important here, the cheek, the, the central malar and outer malar area? No, it's a large component of this is, is the lower portion of the face where it is just, it, it would look odd. And I think this is where a lot of times when people are filling cheeks, they're putting too much in the cheek area and not allowing it to blend down into the face. So a large part is you want to unify the upper, middle, and lower. And here's probably even a better example where you're, I'm being very, very aggressive in this area. And these are just variable. You can see sometimes I put very similar amounts. Maybe I could have put more. In this case, I actually would have put a lot more in the outer cheek. This is probably slightly under augmented. I, as, I, as I said, I'd probably be moving more toward two to three in the outer cheek and maybe a little less in the anterior cheek, to be honest with you, maybe toward one. Uh, these are just, this is in a way good evolution thoughts, and this is just significantly volume depleted. I could have put more, but this is what I felt about right at the time. And, and the nice thing is, even though she may be slightly underfilled, you can come back with uh, you know, in office uh, fillers and, and improve the situation. And so let's talk about blink. And I, I like to use the story of twins because it al allows you to start seeing how we see differently. This is a lady that had a fat transfer at a very young age of 37. She's 42 on the right. And I didn't do anything. I, haven't done, I didn't do neuromodulators. I didn't do further fat or fillers. I just hadn't seen her. She was out of town, came back. She said she hadn't done very much since I'd seen her. And this is just many years later. So she's aged a little bit, but she's still uh, better. If you look at the smaller photograph, the one, she's the one on the right, and her sister is the one on the left. And I think in a blink of an eye, even that, that photograph is so small, you can see that she looks more youthful. Something about her blink effect is very, very obvious to say that. Well, what is it? If you really try to look at her sister on the left, you can see her brows are slightly higher arched, maybe the way she's lifted them, but she's not had any procedures done, not even neuro, neuromodulators. Uh, her lips look fuller, maybe. Her, neuro, her, her nasolabial grooves look about the same. Her jawline looks about the same. But it's the way that light and shadow dances across that face that changes it. And if you go back and look at her when she was a model at 32, you can see I've sort of replicated some of those ideas and it's, it's maintained itself over six years. So the people that say that fat is not permanent really don't understand this. Fat is permanent and that's a good thing and it's a bad thing. And the, the concept is that you've got to do it right. Um, let's talk about light. This is so important because a lot of times when we take photographs, we're used to taking photographs maybe for rhinoplasty, et cetera, we have a lot of washed out light, so you can't show that uh, normally. So we first have to understand how light strikes a face, and from that we want to replicate that maybe in the studio. And what I do is I use top-down lighting, not, not over-exaggerated lighting so they look terrible, but it's, an, it's how we can replicate light in, in reality. So what is it? We sometimes look like Nick Nolte on a bad, bad, uh, bad day or a bad bender. And what we want to do is understand that it's because light strike downward, whether we're indoors or whether we're outdoors. It's always top down, except maybe in the uh, Neiman Marcus uh, dressing room. That's probably the only place that may not be, uh, may have better lighting. So when we have to think about how the face is really a deflationary issue. If the face is a balloon that deflates and we're, we're fuller in youth, that light that strikes it, if you think about if light comes down, and we have a better volume coming convex versus concave, it's going to change the way that light and shadow dances off our face. And so that is why what I'm always looking for, especially when I'm doing fillers, is having the person sit up. And when I'm gauging what to do with fat, the person's sitting up. And I'm memorizing those ideas of where I need to put these, the fat allocation based on shadow effects from top-down lighting. 
You don't want to be looking at a flashed out photograph to determine volume because it's hard to read. And so it just, it, the same analogy goes in the face, is that light should be bouncing all over the place in the right target zones. And those right target zones are everywhere. So when someone asks me, Sam, Dr. Lamb, where are you going to put my fat? I say it's going to be your temples, your brows, your lower eyelids, your outer cantal area, your anterior cheek, your outer cheek, your area below the arch, the buccal zone, the uh, you know, canine fossa, the nasolabial groove, the anterior chin, the pre -jow. Basically, I named every single place of the face, except maybe in the lateral face where things can get a little heavier in some people. So it's just a rethinking of that. So really, the concept here is light in the right way. So let's talk a little bit about longevity. Does fat last? Absolutely. Uh, many years ago when I was studying for the board and hair restoration, I was trying to think about this and I thought this model really works for fat in many, many respects. Because we talk about donor dominance in the world of hair transplant, which is that the hair that is harvested from the back, is, it behaves that way in the front. Same, very similar when we're dealing with fat. The fat has donor dominance. If the person gains a lot of weight, it can replicate that fullness in that. So you have to be very careful when you're putting fat into the face. The same way, hair over time gains blood supply and that blood supply continues to mature over a period of a year. So I think a lot of times when people are over exuberant and want to go back and add fat in two months because it went down, they've got to give it time to mature. There's a, there's a maturation process that, is, that correlates with neovascularization and that's why I think it's important. So what, what I see over a period of time is this idea that things look too swollen and then when it, it, it goes down a little bit, sometimes at a month it looks too good. You have to caution a patient that at a month you're not really getting a result. And I always say that you're really not going to get 100% there. You're going to need some probably small in-office treatments to make it as flawless as possible. Fat is not flawless. Again, that concept will be more discussed on Friday just for the sake of limited time here. And there's a dip period where the, before the fat starts to have that tenacity of the blood supply that occurs over a period of six months and it, and it continues to improve. But it doesn't stop aging. You're going to continue to mature. And I've seen some patients back at five years after fat grafting, and they look like they've lost a lot of it. And a large part is because I don't think I could have stopped the acceleration of their aging due to prior sun damage. As you know, previous uh, sun exposure has a five or ten year ongoing ineluctable uh, volume loss that it, that it imposes on the face. Whereas some people I've seen, I just saw a lady ten years uh, back and she had moved to Pakistan and came back and hadn't done anything and she just looked amazing. She looked better than she did 10 years ago. So it's not that fat is disappearing, it's the fact that that glass of water is continuing to empty. So this is just showing you over a period of time, this is a week, clearly there's distortion, and in a month, maybe too full, maybe good, you know, you can argue. And then over time you're seeing some changes where it's going down, and then maybe it's coming back up, hard to see, but it's, it, it's changing. There's this evolution, and so I encourage you to do with your patients is follow this over time. The only other thing she's had done other than a fat transfer is neuromodulators. So I want to emphasize th these couple concepts again, which is donor dominance. This is something that in the world of hair restoration means that if something is taken from the back of the head and moved to the front, it will behave like that tissue. So when you take fat from the abdominal and areas in the, in the uh, thigh area, it's going to behave that way. That's good and bad. To me, it's the most tenacious fat you're going to have. Estrogen rich and it works well. I love using this, but you have to be careful and use it sparingly. So with that in mind, you know, the concept is do you want to improve graft take? And I really believe that fat, if you're, 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 I'm just trying to shoot for an 80% result because when I shoot for an 80% result, or I shoot for 100% result and it goes down to 80, I'm good. I have a little margin of error, but you don't want to sit there and overcorrect because if you have an overcorrected face, it's the hardest thing to fix and you don't want to have a face that's over augmented. And that's one thing that's really, really important is I always, always tell my patients preoperatively, please consider that we're going to have to do some small touch-ups in the office to make this as good as possible. And, and my goal with a fat graft is to give them the best economy. In other words, I'm going to make that face look significantly better from a blink perspective but I will have to do some small treatments to further finesse the face to make it better. So let's talk about some uh, mechanical strategies going through this and breaking down the face and the subcomponents because I think it's easier to, with a vocabulary to break down certain areas. So the cheek to me is divided into two areas. It's the anterior cheek where you see that malar depression uh, and then you see the area that's centered over the malar eminence maybe a little bit more laterally and those, those are the two components of the cheek and then you add the buccal zone and I think this is really sort of this triangular zone that I really am focused on and filling. And I'm doing, as I was saying, much more aggressively in the outer cheek, much less aggressively the anterior cheek. 
and probably about the same in the buckle. So that's, you know, we all evolve in our thinking. And I think a large part of the reason I'm so conservative now with the anterior cheek is the fact that there's uh, dynamic issues when they smile, it can look too cheeky. So I believe you, don't, you have that uh, impunity when you go to the outer face. In the lower face, you're dealing with the sort of what I call an upside down U, which is an anterior chin depression uh, joined laterally with a pre jowl complex. And so it's not so much the mental sulcus medially. A lot of people are very focused to say, oh, I get it, Sam, you're talking about the, that mental sulcus. No, I'm, the mental sulcus is, is nice to fill at times, but I'm really talking about the sort of lateral aspect where it just starts to look depressed. And when you do that, you start to create an oval of the face. And I think that that outer facial joining I'm really in love with outer facial joining. It's my biggest obsession when patients come in for fat or for fillers as trying to make that face have that nice shape. And I really believe uh, when I'm looking at, it's funny, I look at a Facebook photo of a mother daughter and I'm trying to figure out why does that mother look like a mother? How do I know exactly that mother's? And it's, it, it's sometimes it's one thing or another and it has a lot to do with this outer highlight. The, when I, I'm looking at these areas, and what I'm always gauging my work is I'm not saying to the patient, are you happy with my work? I'm saying, what are people telling you? That's my gauge, because, what is, because a lot of patients don't read their own blink. Other people read it. So my gauge for success is what have people told you? Oh, you know, my mother's fiance, they wouldn't allow him to go through the TSA last week because they didn't know, he, with, with a, a jacket on, because they didn't think he was 75. So the, the goal is, that I'm hearing, what are the things that people are, are gauging? And I'm not trying to make someone look like a child, but the goal is in a youthful state, there's more vibrancy and there's more attraction there. And so that's what I'm reading is, what are other people saying? That's my best question for them. And this is just showing you, just shaping that face. And to be honest with you, this was done a few years ago. I would have done more in the temple, more around the, the, the pre jowl I can easily fix this in the office, and I have. And so the buckle zone, we can further subdivide. Central buckle, which is the major area of focus. Uh, and then you can really understand that this is an, the, the outer area where it's just below the zygomatic arch, malar eminence, is a huge area. When you see that step off point from a frontal view, that's why all my before and afters, I'm obsessed with the frontal. A lot of people that are doing before and afters when they show volume, they're showing three quarter views. Yeah, you can see better volume that way, but that's not the blink. The blink is red on a frontal view. How do you read that person's face in a blink of an eye? When I do fat, I'm gauging frontal view. When I'm doing fillers, I'm gauging frontal view. I'm always going back to the frontal view because that's what matters. Surgeons are obsessed with the lateral view, three-quarter views, basal views. To me, that's not really what is going to affect the blink as powerfully as the frontal view. So get obsessed with your frontal view. And yeah, if you have good three-quarter and, and side views, it's fantastic. And then this area called the medial buccal hollow, which is really not that prevalent anymore. It's really in someone that has significant dentition loss that, I, that you need to fill that frontal zone to blend it in. The only thing with that is sometimes it can exacerbate the labial uh, mandibular fold or the, the, the puppet line, that is a marionette line. So you gotta be careful of how much you put in there. And this is just showing you really blending in that area to me is important. And this is an area where I wouldn't because she's very full in the lower face. So what I wanna do is de-emphasize that outer face, not put anything in the buccal zone because it's not gonna look right. Uh, and this is an example of just a wide face where I put nothing in the buccal area, everything was anterior cheek and outer cheek to offset that width, and then the face actually looks a little bit narrower. So framing the eye is the antithesis, as you know, of blepharectomy, excuse me, blepharoplasty, which is really the, the idea of just allowing that area to be blended in. So what is it? We always talk about just thinking some fat there. Well, let's break it down into subcomponents so we can see that. So the first thing we want to do is understand that framing is an eye that looks open eye. You want to frame down that eye and make it look better. And this is an example of too much. I'm taking some of it away at the same time I'm adding. So I'm not opposed to an upper lower blepharoplasty. This was done in conjunction with that. And this is showing you that she's had a blepharoplasty. What are you gonna, she still looks a little tired and maybe some ptosis on that photograph. But the question is, what are you gonna do to make that look better? Are you gonna unframe her more? No, you're gonna reframe it. You're gonna actually sandwich that eye down a little bit more and bring it to, toward a better frame and a highlight. So let's talk about framing the eye and breaking it down into, into components. So the first thing you wanna talk about is the, the medial uh, area. We're going to actually go through more specific technique in a moment, so don't worry about that. And then this is just breaking it down into zones, and then the lateral area. Why break it into two areas? It's just easier when I'm augmenting the, the, the lower eyelid to keep my numbers straight, the volume more consistent, etc. And again, you'll see that in about five minutes. And then a um, little nasal jiggle groove. How much should I put in there? I'm going to get through that, so don't worry about numbers. I'm just showing you how I break down the eye. The lateral canthus must be done. 
uh, when I was starting to do fat, I was thinking, you know, I just approach it from the inferior aspect, it's enough, it's not. There's a little dip that occurs on the outside. You've got to approach it separately and manage that. The lateral brow complex is beautiful. You've got to really shape that in a, in a good way. And then A-frame deformities, either from previous blepharoplasties or from just ongoing progression of aging in the zone. And then the whole complex filling in. One thing I really like what uh, Mark and Rob has contributed to the literature is understanding type 1 and type 2 eyelids. And going back and making sure you don't take an eye that's type 1, which is full in youth, um, and sorry, let's say a type 2, which is hollow in youth, and really converting it to an eyelid that doesn't exist in the way they looked in the past. So using old photographs is not 100% relevant for me in many respects, because I can see through that face where that face was 20 years ago. But in the upper eyelid, you don't want to overfill it and bring them to a state that they weren't in when they were 20. So there are different differences in the upper eyelid complex, and so you've got to be careful with that. And then sometimes I'll fill a little bit there because you'll see by filling the upper and lower eyelid, there's a little bit of demarcation zone that you want to blend in. So how do we do this strategically? Um, I always like to imagine in my head how I'm going to fill the face when the person's sitting there before I actually go in the room. So I've actually sort of mentally memorized in this face what I'm going to do. And it doesn't matter if there's a 50 billion drawings there. It's just for me to, to keep in mind what areas I want to do. This is temple, the lower eyelid. You can sort of see the uh, anterior cheek, the outer cheek, some of the buckle zones that I've marked out, uh, the anterior chin, the pre-jowl with that uh, oval circle there. And the little red dots are just my entry sites so where I'm going to enter in. So harvesting, you know, this is all covered in the book. Uh, it's not a re real reason to go to, through too much of it. I haven't really changed much. I do prefer my, to do my procedures under general anesthesia because there's very, I don't need to even use lidocaine anymore. There's some ideas that lidocaine causes toxicity in the fat, and I would say I've done it both ways, and I think that's an overstatement. Um, the goal, clearly, the key thing is just to reiterate a point in the book is that when you're harvesting from the, the medial complex, or medial, uh, excuse me, medial thigh, you really want to go through that fascial plane and not see the, see the reverberations of your cannula going through subcutaneously, otherwise you're too superficial, and you'll create contour issues. Um, just blend, and that's a really important thing. This is just the tray setup, which we'll, we'll show you what we're going to do is the goal is to try to um, harvest fat once the fat has been harvested. These little Johnny Lock things uh, from Tulip, I have no financial interest with the company, uh, is, are really nice for you to save yourself that need to hold negative pressure. I hold two to three cc's of negative pressure. And you go ahead and just put the cap on uh, on one side, take off the back side, put on the little uh, top cap, and then centrifuge. And, and a lot of people, this is the part where people are about to start taking notes and are really obsessed. How do you process the fat? It, here's, here's how I do it. It doesn't matter. Um, the, the reason I say that is I've dealt with, I've worked with patients, I've worked with uh, surgeons who have got great results who've washed it. Those that centrifuge it, those that use various proprietary techniques to, to process it. And I would say that it doesn't matter too much. I mean, this is 3,000 RPM at three minutes. You know, I know my colleagues do, you know, 3,000 RPM at one minute. Some do 2,000 at 30 seconds. Uh, some wash it. This is, I'm just showing this so that you, you're not going to ask me afterwards, how do you process the fat? Because it doesn't matter. Um, just be gentle with the fat, take care of it, and it, I, I don't believe it matters how much contact time with the air, etc. Uh, uh, obviously everything is done as sterile as possible. Fortunately, knock on wood, I haven't had an infection, but I do everything prepped, draped, sterile, sterile gowns, everything, and, and I just feel it's better. Supernatant, infernatant, you know, you have the, uh, the uh, fat above and you have the blood and lidocaine below. You're just pouring off the, the fat. Always pour the top supernatant off first, so otherwise you're going to have the fat slide out. Then you uh, just drip the infernatant out. Um, I like to just drain a little extra um, fat if there's a lot because I just like to make sure that I keep my numbers straight. But you know you can actually keep some of the oil; it's not a big deal. And just tapping out so you make sure there's no fibers left. And then I transfer into a 25 cc syringe, and it just makes it easier to actually load each of the one cc uh, injection injection syringes. Always make sure that you you slide it down so that you don't shoot across the room the fat. That's a very small thing, but it's important, and then you get the fat ready to go. Transfer into 1cc syringes lure lock, obviously, um, using this little uh, uh, lure lock exchange. And then uh, people always ask, you know, what cannulas you use, and, and the answer is I just use a standard 1.2 millimeter. Mark likes the 0.9. I find it's too delicate, too fragile, and it's really hard to manipulate in the areas. So the 1.2 is, for me, the workhorse for everything. I, I never switch cannulas. And you can basically use whatever you like. I don't think it really matters. And I, I think there's a lot of obsession with 
technique, which I understand. That's why this this is more this talk is more on technique and a little less so on on uh, philosophy. And I've got other talks, uh, as I said, tomorrow that are going to be focused on communication uh, and and design. And this is just this is an old photo. You see, I don't have this kind of Mac anymore. But this is just always having the image in front of you, so you go back and you're. So I'm, I'm, I'm. One is, you know, people ask how much volumes do I put in. Well, I'm gauging it based on what I see in the in the holding area. What and then what I see on the table. I there's some edema, and because I don't use lidocaine, there's less edema. But I'm looking at things that are shaping. The patient's supine and swollen, so it's hard to read 100 percent. But I do look at how one contour change affects another change. That's what I'm doing when the person's lying down. And then I'm always going back and looking at the photo probably two or three times during the injection to just corroborate, you know, oh, did I mean to do this? Is this better? Let's, let's hold off before I do that. And these are just the different cannulas that are present. As I said, I use the 1.2 of everything. A large part of fat is feel, you know, and it's not just the way you look. I would like to put a plug in for uh, Mike Nike's course. Uh, it's probably my last year I'll be uh, teaching there. Sorry, Mike. Uh, but it's, uh, it's really a great course. I don't have any financial affiliations in St. Louis. You can ask me about it afterwards. And a lot of hands-on with cadavers. It's fantastic. I mean, uh, if you haven't injected the lower eyelid and felt, felt the release of the arcus marginalis, and it, it, the cadaver is identical to what you would feel in a, on, a, on a human. And I, and I help, help you guys do that, because I know the lower eyelid is the fear zone. So I have a little short video for the eyelid portion, which is the more complicated area. But it's a feel. Um, so when we fill the lower eyelid, and there'll be a short video in a second, you've got to, in my opinion, now there's a lot of varying opinions, and so this is just one man's opinion. I don't like to go superficial. I don't like to get close to ciliary margin. I don't like to use fat as a contouring to make f finesse work. I think it's too dangerous. I just place mine right at the orbital rim. I feel the release of the arcus marginalis, and I don't like to get aggressive in a supramuscular plane, and I'm using a pretty conservative volume usually about 1.5 cc's medially and 1.5 cc's laterally, maybe about 0.5 or so cc's in the lateral canthus and maybe about a half a cc in the nasal jugal group. Um, so we'll go through each of those numbers as we go forward again. This is, and so the reason why there's that bony um, uh, little side area is to show you that we are releasing that orbital septum in that area and I believe if you're not doing that, you can place on the wrong side of the rim. So it's a very slow, tedious injection process to be careful. The only difference in this photo, which I took a few years ago, is that I'm actually injecting through two ports. So I, it, and you can use as many ports as you want, but if you look at the lower eyelid like a circle, like a hemicircle like this, I like to inject it perpendicular to all points. So I just make three entry points now instead of one. It just, I feel a little easier access to the lateral area uh, of the orbital rim. And so instead of having to skew it this way, I find it a little bit easier access point. And here's a, I think this is the video. Uh, Leo, can you play that for me? I believe it's a video. Oh, this is the video. No, sorry, let's go, uh, stop for a second, don't, don't move. Um, this is, sorry, it's not a video. This is just showing you that you want your non-dominant hand to protect the globe, and it's, it's, it's a smart hand technique in the sense that it's not only protecting the globe, but it's telling you where you are. So you're feeling a little release of that arcus, and you're also feeling the tip just skive across the, um, across the bone. The other question I get all the time is, are you injecting while you go in or while you go out? It doesn't matter because it's a cannula. You're just flowing it back and forth in both directions, putting about 1 50th of a cc per pass. So let's go and play that video. I apologize. Go ahead. Audio, please. Okay, no audio. That's all right. So I forgot. I, I, can't, I couldn't remember if I... Um, so I'm just dancing across the rim and just placing little aliquots across there. And, the, and, and that's the real key here, about 1.5 cc's medially. And always, always, always protect the globe as you move forward. And if you feel there's resistance and you can't quite push it, then um, what you want to do is just make sure that you're uh, stopping, coming out, pushing the, the, the fat that's, that's uh, and discharging the fat in the air so you don't get a globule down there. And I really believe this is something I would attribute to Mark is teaching me, and I've not had issues below the eyelid because you don't go from lateral in. And I, I think that's probably, if you remember one technique pearl, that's it. Release the arcus, go at the, stay at the rim, and don't go lateral in. If you start going laterally based, which is funny because all my fillers are a, parallel to the rim, and, and my fat is perpendicular, and it's deep. So that's something you need to just know is a difference. And then the lateral canthus, just going in there, making sure you put some fat in there. I really believe if you don't put half a cc or a little less than that, you're going to have a little transition point that's obvious. 
And then uh, nasal jugal groove, this is overrated in my opinion. When you do a good lower eyelid uh, fill, you don't need to put a lot there. I put a half a cc or so. I think this can look too full. Again, one thing I'm trying to do is avoid too much medial um, fill because you don't want that to bunch when the person's smiling. So a large part, a little pearl that I'll, I'll say also when I'm filling um, faces for uh, 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 fillers, I'm actually sometimes having them smile and look at the transition point of how much is it uh, is going to the anterior cheek. I think a large part of our sin that we've committed um, in filling the face is uh, attributed to the anterior cheek. And so the, the less you put, the better in that area. Um, and then the brow, this is just filling that area uh, in, a, in a plane of least resistance and then the areas that I told you about. So we'll play a little video here. I think this one does have audio. Leo? This is what I call a plane of least resistance. It's quite easy. And so what we're going to do is just send it from the site. And we're just going to pass it in the plane of least resistance for her. And you can just see it just follow it. What I like to do is not only feather below the hairy brow, but get into the upper eyelid as well. So if you take a look, I'm just arching across the whole thing. Some authors really advocate filling the lateral brow aspect. Some like the medial brow aspect. My humble opinion is that I really like the entire brow fill. I think it's a really attractive look in most people. So I'm just sliding across it. If they really got a very, very... Um, hollowed out upper rim. You want to just feather over the eyelid area, um, but that's an advanced area, so you want to be really careful when you work in that area so that you don't create too much edema and too much distortion for too protracted a period of time. And then the anterior cheek, again, this is probably, if you have one more take home lesson out of this whole long talk, is be careful with the anterior cheek. It used to be a favorite area of mine. It's now an area of great trepidation. It's just an area that can be, it can stay with you years down the road, it can be too full, especially during a, a smile. So be very conservative. What are we talking about? Maybe even no more than half a cc. It, and sometimes just leave it out. You know, I, I, don't, I used to put in about one to 1.5, two cc's, but I've, I've scaled back a lot in this area. And you know, what you want to do is just come in from that same uh, lateral port so that you're, you're approaching the malar septum in a tangential approach and you're going from deep to superficial. And that's what you're seeing in the uh, small schematic of the bone on the bottom right. Uh, and this is just showing you the lateral cheek just going through one of the uh, infraorbital entry points and just blending out there. And a large part of what I'm doing today is not just hitting the malar eminence, but going lateral to the malar eminence and just feathering over the edge and down it because I really want to shape that outer face contour. Now, the person's really heavy set. You don't want to broaden the face. And I know women are very obsessed with not wanting a wider face. I get that. But when there's a skeletonization process, I believe that by filling this area, not only makes it look better, but it can take and detract away from the way you visualize the lower face, as I was trying to show you in some of the case studies. Um, how much I put in, again, I'm now into the two to three cc range. Buckle is so variable. I put anything from zero up to five or six, depending on how hollow they are. I can even go to eight. But again, with everything, just be very, very careful. So you've got the central buckle, you've got the lateral buckle expanse, and that's really the area, the arch below the bone. And sometimes I'll actually just do the, the lateral aspect from the same port and just feather it over the edge and not have to do this as an isolated, separate um, procedure. And then the medial buckle I rarely do. It's just someone that's really depressed. They have dentition loss, and I'm trying to manage that central space. And then the pre-jowl, the best way to conceptualize the pre-jowl is, is a few ways. One is think of it as a cylinder, where you have the anterior depression that lies anterior to the mandible. And then if you've got this heavy set jowl, even if you're correcting it from a rhododectomy perspective, I still go in there and I fill below the, the mandible. So that's an important aspect. You can't do that with a chin implant, right? You can't go below the mandible. So I fill below the mandible, capture some of that jowl, and then I transition it over. And if the person has a somewhat small uh, chin, I would just go and take that pre-jowl recess and go all the way to the anterior chin. You clearly don't want to over augment the chin, and that's going to be in my uh, fat versus implants talk about when you do an implant, when you do fat. But if they've got a little bit of microgenia, a little bit of loss in the anterior chin, why not just progressively go a little bit further forward? Uh, the, and I really believe a lot of people that are trying to strike out that labial and mandibular uh, fold is, is going to have a hard time with fat. I'm just trying to change that shadow dynamic of the anterior chin, so I'm feathering it where those little landmarks are. And then I'll, I'll further move it toward the uh, mental sulcus as well. The lateral mandible is a tricky area for a few reasons. One is, as I said, a lot of times we start triangulating where our lower face dominates, so it's not necessarily a good area. 
But it's an area that I believe is important when you're starting to see someone that either has had an aggressive facelift and so they've had a lot of soft tissue complex removed on the outer edge, or sometimes on gentlemen, I want to create a little bit of stronger angle, I'll do a little bit there. Or if the person just overly looks sculpted in, the, in this area. The one pearl that I have when I'm dealing with the, this lateral mandible is I fill it, I'll come back and stare over the patient and look straight forward. Because remember, I, I, another pearl that I, I've emphasized maybe six times already during this talk is always corroborate your inject, injection, whatever it may be from the frontal view. Because as surgeons, if you guys are surgeons in the audience, we tend to be very skewed toward the lateral aspect. So everything we do is this way. And what I encourage you is always corroborate your information from a frontal view because that's what looks good. Because otherwise you get this beautiful sculpted mandible that looks good and from a frontal view it looks like a tumor. So you really want to make sure that you're always corroborating from frontal view. So I just divide the lateral mandible into three areas, like a little tulip shaped heart. So a tulip shaped area going down, going backwards, and then going um, this way. And it's just my way of making sure it's all feathered in uh, nicely. And I'm putting in maybe you know, uh, half a cc to two cc's for each of those arms, depending on what I'm trying to achieve. Um, and again, that's, I know that sounds very wide um, range, but it's, it just depends on the degree of loss. And uh, I've heard uh, Bill Little talk about going um, perpendicular uh, to recesses that are uh, there. And I, I think that's a good idea. So when, when you're dealing with a linear recess like the lower eyelid, you go perpendicular to it. I don't do that with fillers. Fillers, I go parallel. But fat, I really like how safe this is by approaching the canine fossa and the nasolabial groove from a lateral aspect. I think it's just easier to do that in that fashion and just safer. And I, I'll put in, you know, two or three cc's total, maybe uh, two in the, in the canine and maybe two or three in the, uh, in the nasolabial groove. And I know this sounds, and, and people always want to know volume, so I'm giving you my range of volumes of what I usually use. And it's not typically that I'll put in seven, eight, or ten. I mean, it's, and I think part of the nasolabial groove that you want to be careful with is if you overfill that area, it can transmit into the anterior cheek. So this is one of those things that the anterior cheek is, for me, an area that I was in love with eight years ago. I, I was mildly in love with four years ago, and I hate now. I'm really focused on, uh, on the outer face in terms of design work. Um, and then just recovery area, you know, they're going to have swelling. And, and I actually, a, a little pearl, and you can learn from this, I've got a, a series of videos uh, call, uh, called Postoperative Video Companions where I talk about patients that they can be depressed the way they look, um, they, uh, how people perceive them. I have videos on perception because a lot of times what we do as surgeons, we fail to engage with a patient psychologically and they're not equipped to handle it. They're equipped to handle all their physicality, but they're not equipped to handle how they're engaging with themselves mentally and how other people react to them. And so uh, I encourage you to watch those videos that I, I have about this and it helps uh, shape that. But basically the bottom line with my post-operative instructions is I don't use bandages, um, I, I can use a little steroids, and there's a lot of voodoo with fat that you're going to harm it. People worry, can you laser over it? Yes. Um, how do you combine it with other procedures? I do a rididectomy after, I do the blepharoplasty, I do the lower, lower eyelid first, because I usually wind up doing a transconch, uh, and then I do the fat grafting next. Um, I will do the facelift after that, and the reason I don't like doing the upper eyelids um, early anymore is that sometimes they have a little bit of lag of thalamus and I don't want to deal with uh, risk of corneal abrasion so I do that at the very end. And then I, uh, I'll do the uh, ridectomy um, uh, almost the last so that I can get a wrap on the patient uh, uh, afterwards. And what I tell my patients is uh, conservatively from a perspective is one week no one likes it, two weeks you may not like it but other people looking at you probably think you look amazing but not everyone. And at three weeks it may take you three weeks to like this. And so, you know, that's probably the best thing. There's not a lot of things you have to worry about in terms of post-operative exercise restrictions. They can, they can work out. The one negative thing is I don't like a swimming. I think it's always dirty. I try to keep them away from water precautions for about a month. And also, I don't like them uh, to do a lot of things that require Valsalva because it's just going to create more uh, intrathoracic pressure, which then transmits into the face and, and protracts the edema. Uh, but beyond that, I think it's still safe. They, a lot of these people are really interested in working out. They can do it. It's not a big deal. Um, and that's basically all I have to say. And I just want to encourage you. I always end with a slide in my talks because, you know, a lot of times we, we, we're mechanical. We try to memorize, hey, how many CCs did this guy say I put in where? And what was that strategy again? Which are critical. If you don't have the strategy points, uh, then you're not going to achieve great, great results. But always constantly look at this. Every single day, I'm constantly judging my work, going, what is insufficient? As I told you, I go on Facebook because I'm looking at, why does my patient still look older? 
or why does that person look younger? What am I doing not enough here? What is that issue? Always have an inquisitive mind. Go to as many meetings as you can to learn and engage with the, the capacity of, of change that we have. In the future, the world is open to you in terms of what the technologies are available. So I, I hope you enjoyed this and that's the end of my talk. I have about four minutes of questions if anyone wants that.